get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the Florida Drupal Camp team for having me. Uh, thank you all for attending. This is my uh, fifth Drupal event. That's my first Drupal Camp, and it's actually my first time speaking. So I'm excited to be here this morning. Uh, I'm going to speak today about documentation for developers. I've been thinking a lot lately about when I first started my career, um, just kind of getting up to speed with everything, and along with developers who are just starting their journey now. Um, and I've, over time, I've definitely learned that there's a lot to learn in a lot of different aspects, and a lot of times the documentation has helped me along the way. Uh, so I started in Drupal 7 back in 2015 after having some freelance WordPress experience. I remember a coworker showing me this graph early on that might be familiar to some of you. Uh, showing the learning curve uh, for popular CMS platforms. Uh, and that Drupal's can be a little bit treacherous in the beginning, a lot of little surprises at the beginning there. And so I started learning a lot about various Drupal technology, things you might be familiar with, content types, nodes, fields, uh, user roles and permissions, views and blocks, modules. And then at the same time, I was learning a lot about just front-end best practices, semantic HTML, accessibility, atomic design, uh, uh, version control. And of course, I was starting an agency uh, as, as a consultant, and so I was keeping in mind customer service, managing tasks across multiple projects, understanding project requirements, dealing with things like scope creep, and of course, trying to keep work-life balance uh, in there all along the way. So when you put all of that together at once, feels a little bit like this, like a boat uh, fighting against a tidal wave. Uh, so needless to say, there's a lot to learn, and it can quickly feel overwhelming to a new developer. And as I was starting, my tendency, was, my thought process was kind of to really dig in deep and say, I need to be a really good developer, I need to get really good at the code. Uh, and maybe that was true, but I think there were other ways that I realized I could also become an effective developer as well, not just the uh, very strict te technical aspect of things. So I work for a company called Gravity Works Design and Development. We're a remote company now, uh, but we are headquartered in Lansing, Michigan, which is where I'm at. Uh, we're focused on websites and mobile apps, primarily in Drupal, a little bit of WordPress and additional work as well. Uh, one thing I've always liked about Gravity Works, where I've been for the past eight and a half years, uh, is that we hire from a number of different backgrounds. We're not just computer science grads. Uh, we've got a lot of different variety in the people who come to our team. Uh, so I, for example, have an arts and humanities degree and a French minor and some work as a jazz trombonist. So not exactly a traditional pathway into web development. Um, others on our team have been teachers, HR staff, uh, support, uh, customer support agents for various companies, and more. Um, so as part of my college curriculum and just my general interest, one of the things I had gotten into was writing in general. Uh, so while in college at Michigan State University, uh, my first job was at the MSU Writing Center. Uh, so I was both their website coordinator, working on their websites, and also a writing consultant who would work one-on-one -on -one with uh, students trying to become better writers, reviewing their work, and really improving their writing processes. And after college, with that degree path that didn't quite exactly go into one line of work, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do uh, and figuring out various different aspects I could get into. And so I did some freelance work. Uh, both web development and also some writing, uh, including for Billboard. Uh, the article here that is on screen is uh, an article I wrote about a uh, special guest at a Taylor Swift tour uh, and how the, the uh, streams and aspects of data that they saw would increase as a result of that. And so when I came to Gravity Works and started my career as a web developer, I brought those writing and communication skills with me uh, and came to the realization that documentation could help me in the moment on projects it could help who I call future Kurt, who needs to uh, uh, refer back to that work, whether it's supporting that project or using other projects that have the same kind of uh, technologies and skills needed. Um, and then I could realize that it would help my team, too. And our team grew over the years, and I was able to use that to help build the team and support them. Um, at Gravity Works in this eight and a half years, I've since had the privilege of uh, hiring 18 different front-end developers as we've grown, uh, including several who also, like me, started their development careers at Gravity Works. <coughs> and all throughout that, I've tried to uh, keep documentation as an important part of our culture. So I'm going to walk through a few section, sections through this uh, talk, uh, kind of almost like a life cycle of a project from start to finish. First is the preparing and planning stage in the early stages of the project as you're just kind of getting going and before you're really doing much coding early in that early phase of the project. Uh, then managing what I call the messy middle, we'll talk about that. Uh, then unlocking future potential through your documentation. 
And then also we'll close a little bit by just talking about the word efficient, a word that comes up a lot lately when we talk about companies and, and the work that we're doing, uh, and how maybe effectiveness is a better goal to be getting for, and how documentation plays in that process. So I'm going to show you a number on screen here. Take a few seconds to review it. Uh, without writing it down, try to commit it to memory. See if you can remember it. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. One of the key points I want to make is that your memory is an unreliable narrator. Uh, so my work as a consultant means I'm often juggling several different projects, seven different, several different priorities at the same time. And when we're trying to move quickly and address our clients' concerns uh, in an effective way and as quickly as we can, uh, sometimes we tend to avoid those practices like documentation that are important but feel less urgent, perhaps. And we just kind of assume that we can remember everything that we need, keep it all in our head, uh, and just recall it when we need it. And often I found that's not necessarily the case. Like, try as we might, we can keep that memory, but it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, and so documentation help off, helps to offload the need to remember everything. Um, it's kind of like you have an inbox in here and you're trying to take that inbox and clear it out, get to inbox zero. Um, and so that keeps you and your mind productive and focused on those harder problems, the technical aspects of the projects that um, we need to use our brain capacity to, to work through rather than having to keep all of the things that we've learned or that we need to remember in our heads. Um, these next few slides will show a few considerations to document uh, through the various uh, parts of the early phases of the project. So I'm going to start by talking about component planning. Uh, we build with component-based design in mind and atomic design. Uh, so our developers working alongside our design team uh, will break down components and then build those out in a component library such as Storybook. Um, atomic design, as you can see on the left here, breaks down into smaller pieces like atoms, molecules, and organisms. So you're taking small pieces, breaking a mock-up into small pieces, building those small pieces out, and then building them in a composable manner. Um, as we do that, we document those components, go through the mock-ups, and, and break down those components into a document. Um, also showing variants and screenshots as we need uh, to just identify what each row in our spreadsheet is there. Um, so the image on the right there is just a, an example of a document we put together um, that breaks down atoms and molecules, a few examples on a project. Um, and you can see in those right, right columns there the names and then some variants of those different components. We'll usually include screenshots as well further on the right. Uh, sometimes with those components, we'll use kind of memorable names like hero or sidekick. Uh, to help build a shared language among our teams when we're talking about these components, whether it's designers or developers or even other folks on the project team. Um, but naming things is hard, right? Um, and what's harder than that is remembering names if you've made unique names but you don't exactly remember what those things are. Um, so including that context in your description of why did you call it this, what exactly is that, adding a screenshot that you can just easily remember that means you can use those names but also uh, build that shared language and that understanding of what those are. Uh, so we do the same thing with our content model, our content structures that we're planning. Like I said, we often are a Drupal shop, and so this usually will be a list of content types and things. But this same practice can totally work with something like custom post types in WordPress as well. Uh, we have been using Notion for this. We use Notion for a lot of our meeting notes. Uh, more recently, we're moving a bit towards uh, a Google Sheets uh, template. Uh, one that's similar to this one on screen, it's not quite the same. Uh, what's on screen here is Drupal's spec tool uh, from Acquia. Um, and it's fairly similar to that. You can see that there are uh, different content types broken down into their fields, machine names, field types, uh, the different references they have, and whether or not the field is required. Um, and so really that, that process is just breaking down and planning out our structures before we really dig into Drupal and get right into the weeds of things. And so that early planning helps us break that down early on, um, and then considering how those content types or those structures will interact with one another. Um, we like to uh, plan our development tasks beforehand as well as much as we can. Really before we dig in too deep and, and start just building, we try to do a little bit of planning as well. Um, this gets our thoughts in motion early on. Uh, and also allows us to take those early plans and let them kind of gestate in the back of your head as you're doing other parts of the project. So we might do this early planning and then jump into building out components, but while we're doing that, we're thinking about the overall goals of the project and the development tasks that we've planned and the work that we're going to do, 
and realize that we can refine those ideas and build upon them as we go before we get to them, and it just makes us more efficient. Um, one recommendation I have is that the titles of these tasks should be uh, actionable, action-based titles. Um, so often starting with a word like create or build or add um, will allow you to have a nice uh, clean title that is uh, uh, easy to follow. So one example to avoid, uh, for example, footer background is blue, might be a task that you might add. But then you might have to think, is that a request because your mock-up has it in blue and you need to change it in your design? Or is it that the website has it in blue and the mock-up is different and you need to change it? Rather than spending time figuring that out, if you have a, a task that says change the footer background to blue, that makes that a little cl uh, cleaner and easier for you to understand what needs to be done and you aren't wasting kind of that brain energy on thinking through that. Uh, so your task should really kind of identify a problem, right, or a goal or an issue that needs to be resolved for the project. Think a business rule or a QA issue or a bug. And the title should be the solution to that problem. So for example, on the screen, on this example I've screenshotted is to allow admins to manually reorder a list of resources. So it's a clear identification of the problem and we know what our task is to go in and resolve that. Uh, in that task, I would say to include descriptions, screenshots, any user acceptance rules, uh, any other context that's needed and that's useful uh, so that you can uh, work through that problem with as little additional thought as needed. You understand what's needed of you and you can get right in and fix it. Um, and then I would say these tasks don't feel like when you've set them up the first time, don't feel like they're set in stone. Uh, you can definitely change a title or add to a description later as needed. It's kind of a tendency to say, well, this is my task and I need to stick with it. But if you've realized that the plans need to change a little bit, uh, go ahead and uh, change that as well. All right, so on the second slide here, here is a more high-level overview of uh, tasks on, a, on a, an example project here that I worked on. Um, you can see kind of action-based titles, build feedback collection dashboard, add feedback collection information to the content editing screen. Uh, and then as you would work your way into those, you would see descriptions on those tasks as well with more information. So documentation is the act of thinking and then putting those thoughts on paper or digital paper as it is. Um, and it doesn't have to be this huge foreboding responsibility. I think when I talk to other team members about it, they kind of get this idea that, you know, I have to write this giant tome of information in order for it to count as documentation. Um, and I have done that before. And there was one example I can think of where I had a very technical uh, implementation that I did and I wrote 12,000 words of feature documentation on it um, just because I was getting really technical and I wanted to make sure I could hand it off to an additional team who would uh, maintain it in the future. That's documentation, but also smaller notes, comments, commit messages, uh, status updates. I would also include those in your thoughts of documentation as well. And that's something you can do little by little. Um, by putting those thoughts on paper or in writing, you're relieving your mind of the responsibility to hold on to them. Um, so that, like I said before, allows you to free up your brain to think more through uh, problem solving and innovation and our client goals. Um, and it also kind of frees up your mind so that instead of having to hold on to things in your memory, um, we are freeing ourselves up so that when you're walking the dog or you're taking a shower, that's where those kind of thoughts come to mind, that that's where you start to innovate and have good ideas. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more in the next section about some use cases for documentation uh, in this next section, what I like to call the messy middle. So the messy middle is the part of the project where uh, you know, you've gone through discovery, you've gone through your designs, developers are starting work now, and working through requirements and building out a site. And as they do, and you're meeting with your client, and you're having discussions about things, your plans kind of inevitably change as things go, scope creeps, that kind of thing happens, and clients really start to see a working website, and see what they can do, and then things maybe start to change a little bit, and that's where things can, if you're not careful, get kind of messy. Uh, so documentation practices, I found, really help to keep that scope clear, uh, keep your plans in motion, and ideally keep your stress lower as well. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Miller's Law. Uh, Miller's Law comes up in user experience and psychology, uh, and Miller states that the immediate memory span of people is limited to approximately seven items, plus or minus two. Um, he did stress that the magical number seven, as he called it, isn't exactly a hard and fast rule. Um, but it's an average, give or take a couple, that he saw fairly often. And this shows that trying to keep a lot of information in your memory is likely to fail because your memory span just can't hold on to all of those things all at once, no matter how hard you try. 
So let's go back to those 10, digit, uh, 10 digits that I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, and I, you don't have to answer out loud, but just think I to yourself. To. You want to. Okay, go ahead. First six. Five, one, seven, two, two, eight. Yeah, you're close. The first one you're definitely right. Okay. Um, so, uh, like I was going to say, yeah, thinking about several other things in the back of your mind, uh, we've learned several things, introduced several concepts along the way, um, and whether or not you remember those numbers. Miller's Law that we just talked about might suggest that you don't because we've just had so many other things in our mind that we've been learning about and thinking about but there were just too many things to keep in memory. So now what if I had shown you those numbers in this form? <laughs> so you got the first three right, uh, and the last, the last three there. Uh, so yes, it is a phone number, uh, and if you need a website, feel free to call it. That's Gravity Works' phone number. <laughs> <laughs> this process is called chunking, uh, and these chunks, Miller says, and other uh, in the industry say that it's easier to digest those in chunks, and I think that's why our phone numbers are kind of set up in that way, where you have three, three, and four like that in the U.S. Uh, so Miller even said that the size of the bits of those in information is not so much important as the number of those bits that you have to remember. So having to remember three bits here instead of ten numbers makes that easier for you to digest it and hold on to it. Uh, so a little bit more about chunking. Uh, the practice of chunking can be used when documenting too, and that's whether you're documenting tasks or whether you're documenting things like meeting notes. Um, you want your tasks and your notes to be in small, easily digestible chunks, um, just like you wouldn't want to be sitting here reading hundreds of words on these slides, uh, or you wouldn't want to read a whole book instead of having it broken down into chapters and paragraphs, um, you wouldn't want to look at a large task that doesn't really give you a good path to start, and you get kind of overwhelmed. If you think about when you do a design handoff and you start to work on a website, you don't want to just say, build a home page, go. You want to be able to break it down into the different sections of the page there and build it out piece by piece. Um, one thing I found that's really helped me is that having my tasks documented in those small chunks lets me jump into a project and be productive even when I only have a few spare minutes. So like when I have one of those days where it's got back-to-back -back meetings but you've got a few minutes in between, sometimes that allows me to make some progress in a small amount as well. And really what you're doing with that also is you're lowering cognitive overhead, um, which is always good because then you're, you're focused on your work, not figuring out what work you actually need to do. Uh, a couple other things I found that are helpful um, is that it helps you more quickly turn your tasks around for review, whether that's to another developer to review a pull request or to a project manager to confirm that the task looks good to them. Um, because you have something that's smaller and easier to test, um, and so it helps with that. It can also help if you need to reassign a task to somebody else. Say you're working with a more junior developer and you want to hand off some work to them or delegate work. Um, it makes it so that they have something small uh, and concrete to work on. You really just want to avoid this kind of draw the owl meme that's here on the screen, uh, where you have one step and then a second step with a lot of stuff that needs to happen in between, and you can't figure out those small tasks and you end up being overwhelmed by it. So our next few slides here, we'll talk about documentation strategies in our code, in our project details, and in our meeting notes. And overall, my recommendation is to document where you're going to see it. If you're working through tasks and you have thoughts on next steps, put those in the place where you're looking at that task, like a task management system. We use Asana at Gravity Works. Um, so putting those documents there, or those notes there, makes it easy for you to grab those right where you're looking for them and to continue on your way. At the same time, um, if you're doing code comments, your project manager doesn't necessarily need to see those, so don't put those in your task management system. On the other hand, don't put information that's only relevant to PMs in your code um, and expect them to see it. So putting it where you're going to see it and where your other team members are going to see information that's relevant to them as well. So we'll talk a little bit about documenting code with comments. Uh, one thing I try to remember is that code is strict, but writing is not. Um, you can use more prose and description in your writing, um, but you can't really do that in code necessarily without introducing bugs. So that's where I try to pull comments in to help with that. Um, I know there's an argument in uh, kind of the development community that your code should really be self-descriptive to describe itself, um, but one thing I found is that that doesn't often account for things like business logic in a client. Uh, client's goals, and so when you don't have that commented, and especially if somebody new is getting in the project, that's where they might falter and say, I don't understand why this is happening the way that it is. Well, it's because there's a business rule that wasn't documented and wasn't known. Um, so I like to include those in our comments when needed. 
Um, I also like it because that helps me uh, explain to a different developer who might be getting into the project, um, help teach them kind of those uh, less familiar parts of the project as well. I think that's where comments come in handy. Uh, when writing new code, I'm talking about chunking, um, that's where I will use that to kind of write out the steps of something I need to work through in code. And then, so I have a few lines of comments there, and then I'll fill in the necessary code below each step. So I've kind of done a little bit of pre-planning, and then I've written my code, and I've commented it at the same time. Uh, so for example, let's say I'm pre-processing a node, and I want to create a variable for it. I might write some comments indicating that I need to check the node's content type, check if a specific field is empty, and then assign its value to a variable that then I would use in a Twig template. Um, I like to include URLs too, when possible. Um, so if I were to pull a snippet or an idea from another site, say Stack Overflow or a Drupal.org comment, I will include a URL to that idea. And what that does is it leaves the breadcrumb for me that points me back toward my earlier thinking. Uh, one time I had an issue where uh, I was on the phone with a client uh, because something was wrong with uh, registration on their website. They were working through kind of their fall registration for uh, it's an athletic association. And I got into code that somebody else who was no longer with the company had written 500 lines of code, zero comments. And it was code that was unfamiliar to me on the phone with a client. And so that's where uh, comments would have come in really handy. And so what I did is as I was writing that out, or as I was reading through it and understanding it, I was writing the comments so that I would help myself in the future as well. Let's talk next about whoops, architecture decision records, or ADRs for short. Uh, these can be decisions that you make on a project, and they also can document invisible standards or things that you might do by default that you don't necessarily have written down. Um, include context about why the decision was made, uh, and then the uh, details and the consequences of that decision. Um, these are decisions that are meant to be more long-term, they're not necessarily short-term decisions, but they don't have to be forever. I mean, I think we all know that technology moves quickly, um, a lot of the things that we work with move quickly, and so as technology evolves, our decisions can evolve too. Usually a recommendation for that, you can see a status uh, of approved on the one in the screenshot here, um, but if something changes where that decision is no longer relevant, you can mark that as superseded instead, and then create another ADR that details the new decision and now overrides that original one. Um, if you're interested in learning more about these, uh, I went to DrupalCon Europe this past year, uh, and Lullabot's Director of Technology, Andrew Berry, actually did a full presentation on ADRs and how they use them at Lullabot. Um, what's interesting is that theirs are more organization-wide, so the kind of standards that they have across all of their projects. Um, I went after that conversation and that, that uh, presentation, we're kind of moving in that direction at Gravity Works. But at the moment, we're doing ours more on a project-specific basis, um, so making decisions on the project work that we're doing. Um, documentation, too, I think it's important to remember. So that helps uh, with the uh, decisions that you're making and helps you to defend the decisions that you're making with other stakeholders, uh, and also helps you remember why you did what you did in the future. Uh, I think, like we talked about with Miller's Law and holding on to memory, if we move three months into the future and you're reviewing back your comment because there was a, um, a QA issue, you want to remember why you made the decision that you did along the way. So taking notes in meetings. Uh, I want to stress that documentation is everyone's responsibility. I think even developers during meetings. Um, it's our responsibility to understand a client's goals and their needs and for us to ensure that we understand what they are and how our work is going to meet those needs. Um, I would recommend not transcribing the full conversation of the uh, meeting, if you can. Um, AI tools will help with that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but do note down important information, decisions made during the meeting, and any next steps that you need to take. Uh, definitely take advantage of document templates, like the one that's fairly small, but you can see there at the bottom there. Um, doesn't have to be a huge thing, but you just have agenda notes, uh, your meeting notes, and then your next steps. Um, and when you can prep your agenda notes beforehand, that allows you to come into the meeting focusing on the meeting itself and the questions that you need to answer rather than having to remember what agenda items you have. Uh, one tip that I have, as you can see on that screenshot there on the right, is to use emojis to highlight action items during a meeting so that you can quickly find when you're finished with the meeting what next steps you have. Uh, so usually what I'll do is right after the meeting is over, I'll scroll back through my notes, look for anything that I've starred, and then those are my easy notes of my next steps that I need to take. 
uh, and make sure to write down those next steps. Um, one thing I found sometimes is that you're in a conversation and if a conversation wraps up and your next steps aren't clear, you won't move forward successfully. So take the time to get that clarity and then get it in writing so that you know what you're going next. Lastly, I found this process very useful, something I call checking out. Um, so I'm a team lead who splits my time between coding, attending meetings, and pairing and helping other developers. And so when I have my work that I need to do, I need to be able to jump into it without wasting a lot of time and energy uh, figuring out where I last left off. Uh, so what I'll do is before I switch projects, before I end my day, especially if I'm about to go on vacation, um, I'll just leave a comment that notes where I left off on a project and what I think my next steps are. Um, and once again, that's just helping me leave a breadcrumb that will lead me back to my previous notes the next time I get into that project. And really with that, you're just reducing friction. Um, just like you would if you were building a habit of trying to go to the gym every morning and you leave your gym clothes out the night beforehand so that they're ready to go, that's kind of the exact same idea here with your, with your notes. And so that helps me more easily and quickly spin back up, but it also helps keep my team informed of progress. So if I'm working with a project manager who needs to know where I'm at on a project, or if another developer wants to keep me as their manager in the loop, um, they can just see those comments and not check in as a result. We can kind of see those and understand what's going on. Um, that's helpful for me as a manager because I want to make sure that with my team, I don't feel like I'm micromanaging them. I want to be able to let them do their work um, and let them get into the flow without me interrupting them to ask where they're at in the project. And if I can do <coughs> as much of that by reading their comments rather than having to interrupt them and ask them, it helps them keep that flow. Uh, so psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi uh, said in his well-known book, Flow, retrieving information from memory storage and bringing it into the focus of awareness, uh, comparing information, evaluating, deciding, all make demands on the mind's limited processing capacity. So all of those practices we talked about, like I mentioned, are meant to encourage flow, this idea, this ability for a developer to sit down and focus on their work without friction or confusion. And that's really key to productivity and making progress. Uh, so documentation remains a hugely important practice even after the project is finished, if not even more so. Um, that's where I think I found often that its usefulness even increases um, as you reference it when maintaining the project or when you're reusing parts of it on new work. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel on every single project and sometimes there are things that we pull from one project to the next. So I'm sure AI is on everyone's mind. I have a feeling I probably may be the first time you've heard it at this conference since I'm the first session, but I probably won't be the last. Um, and so I have just in general been proceeding with caution a little bit with AI tools. Um, I think there are some parts where I've been able to use it to speed up my workflows, um, but I also definitely want to make sure I'm keeping the human element in mind and in place to review that output and make sure it's giving me what I need. Uh, so documentation can help power those AI tools, but it's hard to do that if you don't have that in written form. If you just have conversations and thoughts, it's hard to use that to take advantage of AI tools. So a couple that I've used, um, Google recently launched one called Notebook LM, um, but then also AI services from apps you might be using like Notion um, can help surface new insights from your docs and provide quick access to information. So you might see in these screenshots here, the first one on the left is uh, used, being used to aggregate information from a number of different books and articles I've read, asking about how documentation can help. Um, so I actually used it to help with this talk. <laughs> And then on the right there is just a Notion AI question and answer from um, actually that 12,000 word document I mentioned that I wrote about a client. And it gave me a quick answer to explain how uh, a process was done in that project. I mentioned earlier to avoid transcribing your meetings. And I think that's because many AI services are now able to do that for you. Um, we use Fireflies a lot, our project managers, especially at Gravity Works, will use that to record and transcribe and summarize our meetings. Um, some have tried other tools like Otter and Rewind. Uh, Super Whisper is the icon that's in the uh, bottom left there. Super Whisper is the name of that, and that is a text-to-speech processor. And so I, there are several others as well. Um, but what I found and what we found as a team is that that helps uh, folks who are verbal processors, who want to talk out their issue, they can get it in writing as well. Um, now they have that written record to refer back to. Um, 
also helped. We had a situation where one of our project managers went ice skating and hurt herself and was uh, kind of using limited mobility um, and was able to use that to kind of get her thoughts out uh, and into writing even though she couldn't necessarily write. So there's an additional advantage of that as well. I do just want to note to please ask for consent before recording others when you're in meetings. Uh, one major pro uh, component of documenting and learning from that documentation is the practice of sharing what you know. Uh, truly, I would say documentation is a team sport. It should be everyone's responsibility and everyone can benefit from it. You learn when writing documentation because you have to understand it in order to produce documentation that others can read and follow. And then, of course, others grow from what you've shared, uh, and that allows you to together build a sort of collective knowledge. few strategies to help you build your collective knowledge with your team. First is to write as you learn. So getting your decisions, your thoughts, and your ideas, and discoveries on paper uh, while it's still fresh in your mind. Um, so you're documenting, and you're documenting in your own words, which also helps with memory retention. Others may also read those notes and help you refine your ideas and advance them as well. Uh, second is this process of rubber ducking, articulating a problem in writing or in speech. I often recommend to my team that if you've tried to solve a problem and you've gotten stuck for 15 minutes, that's kind of the time where it's time to ask for help. And often what they find is that the process of writing out that question and say a Slack message to somebody or to their team, uh, when they write out that, that uh, question and they're thinking through the whole process on the, the problem on their own, all of a sudden they figured out the answer just because they've thought through the whole process before they've even finished writing. Uh, third, I would say, is work in public. We aren't, like I said, fully reinventing the wheel with every Drupal site that we build. Uh, so things that one person shares might be helpful to somebody else at some point as well. I see this happen all the time when I'm working with a team of 10 front-end developers. Uh, so what I do with my team is I encourage them to ask questions in public rather than in DMs using public Slack channels. Um, so then uh, others are able to learn from that as well. And sometimes what happens is, like I said, you, you write out that question and you figure out the answer yourself. But then often what we can do is we can, for example, in Slack, you can add a thread uh, to that message or just another response to it that is just the answer to that question so that if somebody later is coming in asking the same question or wondering about the same thing, they see your thought process written out and they see the answer. Lastly is to answer questions with a link. Um, so this is a good way of building a practice of building a repository of documents. Um, so if you get asked a question and you can't find a document that helps answer that question, you can instead of just answering them directly, move it into a document, like a wiki. We have a Gravity Works wiki in our Notion um, that we can refer back to. Uh, and so then what you have is a link that you can share with that person instead of that, that still has that answer rather than just sharing the answer directly. And then they have a link the next time they ask that question again, everybody else has that link as well, and you're, again, just building up that collective knowledge. Uh, with collective knowledge, you and your team are more easily able to collaborate with and support one another. Uh, so for example, last year I went on about a 10-day vacation to Europe, uh, and during that time, uh, one of the clients I typically work with had a server issue, and usually when that comes up, I will just deal with that through email um, and handle it. Um, but because I had documented that process before I left, um, another team member, when they saw that issue come in, was able to jump right in and fix it. Uh, so this also helps make sure that um, we're able to be flexible. Uh, we really value the importance of flexible time. Um, and so that helps when somebody's out sick, if they need to take a mental health day, if they have an appointment they need to go to, or let's say they need to pick up their kids. Um, that just helps make sure that you're able to support one another in those instances. Uh, and lastly, you build up uh, resilience against employee turnover, whether that comes from things like the Great Resignation or layoffs. Um, because you have a record of that previous employee's past thoughts and decisions that you can refer back to, even if you aren't able to still communicate with that person. So in closing, I just want to talk briefly about how many companies recently have pushed for this idea of efficiency, how effectiveness might be a better goal to aim for, and how documentation is part of that. Much has been said about how companies like Meta have referred to 2023 and now somehow 2024 as well as the year of efficiency, uh, especially with the rapid growth of AI. So this has led to layoffs, degradation and removal of features and services, and the general push to do more with less. 
Um, so I've been thinking about that lately and recently read some advice that resonated with me about how effectiveness is more resilient than efficiency. Efficient teams are those uh, that adopt the earlier mantra that also was popularized by Zuckerberg and Meta uh, to move fast and break things. Uh, they really value urgency over relevancy or importance. Uh, they uh, do things that lead to instability and errors and mistakes. Uh, compare that to effective teams who build with more purpose and intention, um, still quickly when possible, but a little bit more carefully and well considered. Um, they value relevancy over urgency and avoid work that isn't important or useful. And they also understand the value of processes and practices such as documentation that establish stability for the team and its individuals. Um, if you're driving a car, for example, you can be efficient by driving quickly, but you can be effective by making sure that you're driving in the right direction. So take the time to document when you know it's going to help you and your team become more effective. When thinking about effectiveness in the age of AI, a key takeaway that I have is that being effective means getting good at the thinking and the problem solving that AI can't do for you. And I definitely found that documentation helps to speed up that process. So I think it's good to take advantage of AI and other efficiencies when you can, um, but it's no substitute for the process and the practice of actually considering, thinking through, and writing down those decisions and your solutions. Um, you make yourself irreplaceable when you can use that documentation to plan and problem solve based on your past experience and your uh, team's knowledge. So I may be questioning, how do I make the time to actually make that documentation happen? And I know, especially in the consulting world, that I often am juggling multiple priorities, multiple projects, and addressing client concerns quickly. And so that's where that question comes up. I hope throughout this session I've shown that taking time to build documentation into your team's culture really helps that team thrive. You're able to remove silos. You're able to build that collective knowledge. Um, I'd also say to do it little by little. Like I mentioned before, um, you don't have to write 12,000 words for everything to be documented. Um, you can plan, uh, have planning documents, code comments, status updates. All of those kind of things count as well. And if you see something that lacks documentation, uh, like that function with no comments I mentioned, just take some time and gradually build it up, little by little. You're able to make progress on that and build uh, knowledge through those documents. Uh, third is to make it everyone's responsibility. Again, documentation is useful for everyone, and so it really, I do think, belongs as part of an effective developer's role um, to help both yourself and your team. And lastly, tend to your garden. Uh, so what I mean by that is that documentation will grow stale over time if we're not careful. Um, so continually sharing out those links to the documentation with your team, reviewing and refining it, and then revising it helps to extend its usefulness. <clears throat> so make part documentation part of your definition of done. Uh, just like we do with uh, making sure that we're solving a problem for a client, that we're building an accessibility, build documentation as part of that too. Build it into your processes, make it a part of your projects and your tasks. And if you don't have documentation that you need from somebody else, encourage them or even help them to write it as well. You're building that team, it's collective knowledge. With that, thank you for your time this morning. Looks like we've got a few minutes if everybody, anybody has any questions. Yeah? So you mentioned um, that in Slack, you might have a question in the public channel, and then you use the threads to answer, make sure somebody's answering that question. Yep. Have you found a good way to extract that question and answer from Slack to put it into a more permanent and more easily searchable location? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, um, taking that taking that documentation from Slack out. Was that what was that? Confluence? Yeah, Confluence is a good example of that. Okay. Um, a lot of times, too, what I'll do is I'll search right in Slack. Um, usually, I think that's where I find a lot of our answers because we're just having so many conversations about things, whether it's business rules or it's bugs um, or error messages. I think that's the one that we see a lot as well, where somebody will just ask, you know, I have this error message. Do you know what's going on with it? And often the first thing that I will do if I'm answering that question is I will search right in Slack. Uh, to just see if that, that error message is there. So I do treat Slack as, and I guess that counts too because we have a plan that retains all of that information in Slack. You know, there are some plans that just do a smaller uh, amount of data retention there. Um, so that's one way. I do know some of the apps too, like we use Notion. I believe Notion has a way to take that and turn it into tasks. I know Asana does, um, so you can move into Asana from there. 
Um, so yeah, I would look into definitely app integrations to see where you can take that comment and create a task or a document out from it. Any other questions? Thank you again.